For those that probably seen me before that have attended other Oshag uh, and Osh camp events, uh, I've talked about parallel processing and artificial intelligence, among other things. One of the areas I'm working on at the moment is machine vision um, and how that is now becoming uh, a very common tool. Um, but before I do that, let me just give you uh, an overview of myself, just so people know who I am. This is where it all started for me. I don't know if anyone had one of these, a kind of 160, 151 electronics kit. Uh, reading magazines such as Everyday Electronics and Electoral. I should imagine there's a very large group of people in here that are probably uh, too young to know what these magazines are. Uh, there are some others that can probably remember making things such as this, that's uh, an AM radio, among other things. Uh, some of which worked, some of which didn't. Um, then this, this kind of stuff came along. Uh, my very first computer, a ZX81. Uh, fantastic little machine from Sinclair. That, that led on to these kind of different processors. One of my favorites, the 6502, which was later used in the BBC, 6809, something I used at uh, college. Um, which meant I had to understand things like this, uh, the uh, Van Neumann architecture for processing. There's the chap himself. Uh, that's how we used to do programming when I was at college. Uh, occasionally, we would let loose on a hexagonal key, uh, hex keyboard, uh, which made it a little simpler, um, that kind of thing. Um, and then later on, we even had like printouts and stuff like that, which was, you know, amazing. Uh, and then things like the Apple II and stuff came along, and we actually had screens and a keyboard, and we could type our stuff in and start programming and editing. Uh, meanwhile, after two AI winters, uh, the perception was Perceptron was revisited. People like Marvin Mintz did a lot of work on artificial intelligence, uh, and I came across this in a bookshop when I was at university and fell in love with the idea of parallel distributed processing. Uh, this was really focused on uh, uh, artificial neural networks, among other things, heavy in learning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, same time, 16-bit uh, processing occurred, 68,000 there, um, which made, this is the Apple Lisa, for those of you this was the thing that was kind of in between the Apple Macintosh, sorry, the Apple IIs and the Apple Macintosh, this kind of hybrid thing with a graphical user interface. I ended up working with a lot of that, writing things like Pascal, for example, and Intel then came to dominate the market with things like this. That's the 55SX from IBM. I remember having to get something like 200 of those working, having a room full of them, trying to get them working with a graphics card that worked with some of them and didn't work with others, uh, at British Aerospace. And then I got back into doing a bit more of this, because I thought, oh, I could do a lot more with this now. Um, I don't know if anyone recognizes that particular editor, uh, a DOS editor. And then you had things like Windows come along, and graphics cards which I spent an awful lot of time working with, American companies, UK companies, Japanese companies, building graphics cards, writing softwares and drivers and things for them. That led on to these kind of high horsepower graphics cards. Um, meantime, uh, CPUs were doubling in performance every 18 months, or memory capacity was. The clock speed had reached its kind of climax at about three or four. But uh, the capacity of silicon was still going up. Uh, so you also saw some wilder things, um, such as these. Uh, that's a 64-core processor. Um, I also got in back into hardware with people like Exmos, who do a multi-core microcontroller. You've also got a picture down there of the old transputer from which the XMOS kind of developed its background from. Um, and then this made a real comeback. That's a neural network. In this case, it's a convolutional neural network. Suddenly, there was enough power, processing power, for you to be able to do very complex networks. Um, 
These then came back into the picture because they managed to accelerate it. They grew into things like the Maxwell and the Pascal, and more recently the Volta uh, from NVIDIA, uh, which has literally thousands and thousands of little minute floating point units or uh, numerical cores that can all work concurrently, which provide this enormous uh, power to pro do all the matrix work, the matrix calculations, the multiply and adds that you need to do for any kind of neural network type processing, which got me right back into this stuff. Uh, and because I've been working in electronics and robotics, then I started looking at ways that I could use that in these different areas. Um, kind of adding smartness to embedded systems and robotics, etc. But of course, you can't exactly have one of those to do your processing when it's an embedded robot, or a car, or a vehicle, or an IoT device. There's just not enough power, let alone enough room um, to do it. So what you need is a brain, preferably on the chip that doesn't use an awful lot of power, so you can run your stuff off batteries and things. Um, so. This is a classic one I show every time I do one of these presentations to see where we've got to. It's the S-curve, uh, the old technology. In this case, is really just the old Van Neumann type architectures being multiplied here towards the top. Um, we'll only get you so far. And then there's another S-curve starting, which we still don't know exactly what that is. There's probably a good likelihood it might be something like quantum computing, but that's for another presentation. What I want to talk about right now is visual processing and, in particular, machine learning. So, currently, video processing uses probably more compute resources than anything else on the planet right now. This has grown over the last couple of years enormously. So, this is like a magnitude more computation that's going on concurrently around the world than, than was before, you know, with the internet and things. Um, so what's going on here? Well, there's lots of processing of images in big data, things like classification. Um, you, you will see that Google, Amazon Web Services, Facebook, etc., are processing ginormous quantities of different images. Whenever you upload to Facebook, that is being processed. Faces are being recognized in there. People are being tagged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's going on on a huge scale. Um, can also be used to actually enhance an image. So you can take a relatively low resolution image and you can actually enhance it using neural processing type blocks and units and convolutional neural networks. Um, you can also use it to actually animate videos and create these kind of fake videos and have politicians that you know or celebrities that you know actually saying things that they've never said uh, by getting the uh, GAN networks to actually improvise um, something else that we see more in our kind of space here for hardware, et cetera, is things like face tracking, analysis and recognition, down from things like the, you know, using a camera, camera phone where it tries to track where the face is, et cetera, and get it center and do the focusing and dynamic focusing across, across the images, et cetera. Also for security applications, your face can be your sign-in, for example, or from other security type applications, tracking terrorists or criminals, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other thing is image analysis and identification. This is a huge growing market for embedded and real time, whereby you're actually using video systems in conjunction with hardware for actually doing analysis on and maintenance in terms of installed sites, etc. So I'm going to focus in on the last couple of these, but let's just put some scale into here. So if you're doing machine vision, what do you need? What sort of power do you need to actually get something useful done? So probably at the top of the embedded end are self-driving cars and trucks. Um, they literally need to be processing teraops and teraflops. These are vast amounts of information that needs to be concurrently processed. If you think about a self-driving car, it needs to process not only the video around it, but things like LiDAR, the point clouds, etc. It's also got radar. Some of these systems are layered on top of each other and it's processing them all concurrently. Not only does it need to work out where things are, it needs to identify what those things are. 
Are these safety issues? Are people walking into the street? Where are the lanes? Where, do, where does the car need to be relative to the other cars? Is this a junction? Is that a road sign? What does that road sign mean? You know, is this traffic lights? Should this car be stopping here? There is a huge amount of processing that needs to go on. So you can actually um, put this into cars now, and certainly all the testing that's going on at places like Google, Tesla, etc., are using uh, some very high-end NVIDIA kit. Um, moving down from that, things like inspection drones and vehicles need probably less processing. There's less going on concurrently. The real-time nature of it is slightly less. Then we're talking about gigarops and gigaflops. Um, then we go down to your average uh, mobile phone uh, that has camera. This tends to, this is getting into the area where it, this now has gigarop capability and gigaflop capabilities. I'm going to mention something about that. And then you've got, at the lower end, you've got these very simple robots, drones, uh, and IoT type applications where you might just want to add a small amount of intelligence so that they can work uh, without user intervention. So if we look at the top one there, the self-driving cars, that board there is an NVIDIA board that they're currently putting into many different self-driving cars. That has something like 320 tera ops uh, per set. I mean, it's just incredible amount of processing power on a board that size. Obviously, it's got lots of CAN bus controls and things to hook into the standard electronics that you find in cars these days. Um, it's having to deal with, as I mentioned before, things like identification and interpretation of the objects around the car, people around the car. It has to deal with lane position and speed control. It has to be able to drive itself within lanes, overtake, manipulate itself, follow a road, and preferably not go over the pavement, not run people over, etc. But it must also have some sort of uh, perception and prediction. So it needs to guess what's going to happen next. So there's a lot of that going just in the way that we would do. When we see things going on when we're driving, we're unconsciously making decisions all the time. Um, and it needs to have things like evasion strategies and things, very safe ev evasion modes where it doesn't actually, you know, run people or animals over or kill its occupants, preferably. Uh, and this is massive. There is so much money in this market at the moment, it's incredible. Every vehicle manufacturer you can imagine is spending millions and millions of dollars in, in this area, as well as the upstarts like Tesla and Google, etc. Moving down then, so what, what, what do we want to do if we perhaps don't want all of that capacity in terms of processing? What are we going to need? Um, you know, several tera ops or hundreds of gigaflops. Then uh, again, we're looking at an NVIDIA product here. Um, which is a low-powered version of their Pascal chip or Volta. That might be the Volta version, which is their latest generation of chip. That has about 256 floating-point cores on it, uh, as well as um, what they call some neuro, neural processing um, cores or engines to speed things like convolution, convolution up and addition multipl multiplication. Uh, vectors. Uh, the sort of applications you're seeing this stuff used here, um, you see a drone flying around a wind turbine. What it's doing is it's actually using an infrared camera to inspect the temperature for the various different parts of that uh, wind turbine. Obviously, if there's some friction problems, which you quite often get in the gears of those things, then you get heat buildup, so you'll see a heat pattern. So the drone's trained to be able to focus in on those and work out where those issues are and alert uh, the, uh, the operators that there's a, an issue with that particular device. Again, you get very similar things with the, uh, the power lines there. It can actually map the power lines. It can measure the EMF force coming from the lines, etc. It can see if there's any issues there. Again, it can examine things like metal fatigue, etc. on the structure. Uh, um, Communications masks, again, same sort of issues. Uh, it can go and monitor the outputs from those. It can also look at the physical structure. And then the next one with the drone down the bottom there is an agricultural use. So it can actually go over crops, for example, and using a mixture of things like infrared, ultraviolet, uh, and regular cameras, it can map all sorts of information about the growing crops, how well they're doing, what stage they're at, uh, what sort of temperatures they're running at, that kind of thing. And that can automate farming 
any great sense. Then on the right-hand side, you've got things like the submersible-type robotic systems. Uh, having something a bit more intelligent so it can find its way around and manoeuvre itself is much easier than you have to manually do that. The operator can then focus on you know, the inspection tasks, maybe around an oil rig or something like that, for example. And then the one above there on the right-hand side, we've got a, a robot that actually crawls into long pipes and can actually find uh, issues like fractures in the pipes, leaks, things like that, etc. And it can recognise those. Again, vision in all of these cases and machine, learn, machine um, vision processing is essential to make all of these automotive. But again, th these are still fairly expensive. That Jetson TX2 NVIDIA card that you need to do the processing in that case, they're about £400 each just for that actual processing card, then you're going to need a board for that to sit into and all your sensors, etc. Not only that, because it's a GPU, uh, it actually consumes quite a bit of power. Um, so it might not be applicable um, you know, for smaller type applications embedded or IoT type applications. So what are the options if we move down a bit further uh, into a smaller power envelope and lower cost? Uh, you know, the hundreds of gigawatts and hundreds of gigaflops. What are our choices? This is an interesting example. The Kirin 970 systems on a chip it was recently put in the Mate 10 uh, mobile phone. Uh, so again, this is coming out of the mobile market from China. These are Chinese-made chips, Chinese-made uh, phones. Now, that particular chip, the Kirin 970, is probably one of the first of the new generation of ships that they're finding in cameras that claim kind of AI potential. Um, so not only do they have uh, a quad-core processor that you, you see commonly in phones now, but you've also got uh, the GPU in the ARM world that tends to be like a Marley chip or the next, next version of that, um, which is good for kind of signal processing and graphics if you've got a screen. But they've also added something in here called an MPU. Now, getting specifics about this is very difficult because they, they, they haven't actually revealed it. Um, but having run tests doing inference um, object detection, for example, there are standard inference tests that will read a, you know, a 320 by 240 image and detect hot dogs, for example, uh, one apps. They, they perform very, very well. So what you get here with the MPU the critical thing here on the phone is you're getting kind of two times the port performance for about half or a third of the amount of power use compared to running that on the arm core and the floating point units in the arm itself. Um, so that's the way that the mobile market is going. Um, there are equivalent chips, uh, SOCs, coming from Apple, Qualcomm, Samsung, etc., to put in their own phones that are going to take this further and further. Arm themselves have announced that they will be embedding their own uh, numerical processing units inside their arm cores, directed directly at doing kind of matrix type uh, calculations, just like a TPU does from, from Google, but obviously at very, very low power. So what you're getting is much more uh, powerful matrix, much faster matrix calculations that use a fraction of the energy that the old arm cores would use in order to achieve this. So you're going to see this breaking through, certainly on most mobile phones. They will come with AI and machine vision included kind of thing. Uh, and that's good for us because that brings it down into the maker community in terms of uh, uh, powerful chips available at relatively low cost using low power. And we'll see that break through. Um, so what, what are our choices now? So if we're looking at doing some uh, machine vision, what are, what, what are the things that we have available to us at relatively low cost, low power? Uh, Intel uh, acquired a company, Movidius, a uh, Dublin-based company, about a year or a year and a half ago. And they have, um, they've got this dongle called the Compute Stick, which has one of these tiny embedded processors in it which has uh, numerous little, what they call shark processing cores, which are very, very fast, as well as some hardware convolution type acceleration hardware. 
So you've got a very low energy package that's capable of actually processing uh, tens, even hundreds of giga ops, but it's, it's definitely operations, not floating point operations that this is aimed at. So it works well when you've got integer type operations, but not floating point type operations. Um, so that's kind of, if you like, a very powerful kind of microcontroller, uh, like an accelerated microcontroller. However, there isn't that many development boards available for that to make it accessible that have a camera card. Google do have one. I think that picture of the card there may be the Google version of this, which is the video development kit. But they're like, uh, it's like getting hold of rocking horse um, shit, I'm afraid, because uh, they only made so many of those to kind of see the market. Hopefully, they'll go and produce some more of those. But that will literally sit on top of a Raspberry Pi Zero. You plug your camera into it. And then it then plug takes its camera output into the camera input of the Raspberry Pi and leverages that. Something else that's possible when the microcontroller market is something called OpenMV Cam. Anyone heard of that? Okay. This is a great little project. Um, it's used a lot by uh, 3D drones, for example, and uh, DIY racing cars, if anyone's heard of that, where people try and build a little robot that follows a track that's been drawn on a warehouse floor and they have these competitions. You're not allowed to aid it or drive it. You put it at the start and see how quickly it gets around, if it does indeed get around at all. Now, in order to do that, you need to do some basic machine vision. So this, the OpenMV can be quite interesting because it, all it is is a, a PCB that's got a microcontroller on it. In this case, it's, um, the current version is a, uh, a, an ARM Cortex. It's an ST um, ARM Cortex. Uh, F7, which runs at about 200 megahertz, which has DSP extensions to make things a bit faster. It's got quite a bit of memory and flash in it. Um, also, there's a JPEG accelerator in some of the higher end versions of it, which I think is included with the OpenMV cam. And you can, it's got a camera built into the top, which is just like one of these OVR type cameras, which are very low cost. Although, the OVR cameras that you buy vary in quality dramatically. So they've actually done a lot of work in selecting good providers of these, these cameras from, from Chinese manufacturers directly. And they put decent lenses on the top as well. Because if you haven't got a decent lens, quite often the results you get are going to be really bad to start with. It's kind of rubbish in, rubbish out. Uh, it also accepts somewhat precariously some kind of daughter board. So if you want to add Wi-Fi to it, etc., or a motor controller board, they do some People make some little boards that strap onto this. But probably one of the best things about this is the, uh, they've got their own little IDE, which is really useful. So you can see the video going on, and you can apply processes, and it will draw nice little graphs for you. So for example, if you're detecting different colors, looking for blobs, that kind of thing, then you can see a kind of graphical representation of how well that's doing. Um, that is a Python-based IDE as well. So they're actually running MicroPython on the M7. So the stuff that you write, you can actually control from Python, which I think is a fantastic idea. And we're going to see more and more of that. When it comes to things like machine vision, you need good high-level abstractions to make it accessible. So in the microcontroller world, these are, these are two very good examples that are breaking into this area. Th there are more. Uh, and then one other area that you can use, which is perhaps even more efficient in some cases, is using an FPGA to do some of the machine vision. Now, machine vision tasks vary dramatically. Um, I'm currently working with an organization in Guildford. I'm redesigning their automatic number plate recognition systems, which are these mobile things that go into car parks and that kind of thing and surveillance systems. Um, the algorithms for doing that are actually fairly simple, but it just needs to operate very quickly. So they translate very well into, into Verilog, for example. Um, I'm actually using some lattice chips to do this work. I'm using the lattice ECP5. Um, you can actually go down as far as what's called a, a nice 40 Ultra Plus, which is a little 48 QFN. Uh, it's, it's kind of a $5 chip. Um, that has 5,000 logic gates in it, and you can run on what's called a binarized neural network on that, which is a very coarse, low-level representation. So that you could possibly maybe track a face. You couldn't recognize a face, but you could track a face in a camera-type application. 
Uh, something like the ECP5 will go up to kind of 85,000. Look up there, and it has a lot more DSP units inside or modules inside that you can use to do your numerical calculations. Um, it, whether that be for a kind of uh, convolutional neural network or whether it's just uh, something like a face recognition, face detection or window tracking type application. Uh, and I'm finding that these produce very good, very flexible results. This is one, of, one area that there's a lot of moving targets. There's so much development here, you need to be able to change quite quickly. As better algorithms come out, you need to be able to apply them. Uh, and FPGAs are really good for that. However, it does take you quite a lot of work to actually get these optimized in ways that can then be repurposed. Uh, FPGA design is not uh, quite as easy as software design in that sense. So really, I think we're, we're at a perfect storm for machine learning. We've got very low-cost cameras that are available, you know, directly from China at uh, literally a few dollars. Uh, I remember when cameras used to be $500 a shot, even for the simplest low-resolution one. We've got GPUs, NPUs, and FPGAs uh, to throw processing power at these. You've got good software libraries out there. Just take a look at OpenCL. Uh, that has most of the common, you know, machine image processing type algorithms built into it, as well as some simple vision stuff such as convolutional neural networks, etc. You've got things like CUDA and DNN from NVIDIA, which are the libraries that help you s accelerate your processing for neural networks and parallel processing. You've got ARM neural network software developer kit, which is part of their SeamSys software set now, making that very easy. And again, they're adding in more and more hardware that will automatically be supported by that software. Uh, something to come that isn't really out there a lot at the moment, something I'm spending some time working on, are Verilog libraries for machine learning. Uh, sorry, machine learning and machine vision. Uh, and I want to see more and more of that. More people will get involved in doing that. Uh, so all in all, it's never been a better time to get into machine learning and machine vision. Uh, it's a really interesting time right now, and you'll be able to add this onto your robots, IoT devices, white goods, etc. It's going to become very, very commonplace.